So we can start whenever we're ready. Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. We are team number 17, and our project is encouraging anti diabetic lifestyles in New Mexico communities. My name is Alexis Bransma. I'm Erin Federley. And I'm Tristan Poole. And please keep your questions for the end of our presentation. Do you suffer from diabetes or do you know, know anybody who suffers from diabetes? There are two main types of diabetes, type one and type two. Type one diabetes is caused because the immune system will mistakenly attack the insulin producing cells in the pancreas. Type two diabetes happens because the body will resist the effects of insulin, but the pancreas is not able to produce enough insulin to maintain its glucose levels. A person with type one diabetes they have to inject themselves with insulin, which makes them insulin dependent, and they will also have to monitor their glucose levels. And sometimes they will wear an insulin pump. A type 2 diabetic, they will take medications as well as monitor the glucose levels. Some, one factor that can contribute to type 1 diabetes is just genetics. Scientists do not know why people are getting type 1 diabetes. Although some factors that can contribute to type 2 diabetes is an unhealthy diet, not being active, being overweight, and also genetics. Type two, it is a lot more common than type one, and it is preventable and reversible, unlike type one diabetes. So diabetes, they, it affects the body systems, which makes the immune systems weaker than a person without diabetes. And if it's not properly treated, it can cause some health complications, such as, a, such as damage to blood vessels or complications in the kidneys, eyes, and feet. Living with diabetes, it can be very expensive, such as in, three, such as in 2017, $327 billion dollars were spent on diabetes related costs and this is having to buy insulin, a pump, medications, medical supplies, and also doctor's visits. For our project we are focusing in New Mexico and about 14.1 percent of the population does suffer from diabetes and this is out of 2.10 million people. In diabetes it does have a big impact on New Mexico's health and economy. When we were doing this project, we have learned that everyone, and including our team members, have been affected by diabetes. Including me, I am a type 1 diabetic who was signed in June 2017. I'm currently wearing an insulin pump and a continuing glucose monitor. We want people to be more aware of diabetes, and we have created a visual model that has an effective way of analyzing demographics, as well as educating others on the impacts of diabetes. Our goal when we were creating this program was for, it to was for it to predict the diabetes rates based on the data that we put into it. So now Erin is going to talk about data management. So we made scatter plots that will determine which variables should be implemented into DAM, which is our neural network that Tristan will talk about later. We chose scatter plots because they're quick and easy to make and analyze. TPR is total population rating, which is the daily traffic plus the population. So this will give us an accurate number of how many people are in the community. And our scatter plot showed us that there tends to be one fast food restaurant for 5,000 TPR in a given area. And they also showed us that there is about one healthy food restaurant per 24,000 TPR in a given area. 
Now, this might be true because fast food tends to be much more popular than healthy food in today's society, which makes it a major contributing factor in New Mexico's diabetes rates. So we used Python to analyze .csv files, and we found it to be very useful in collecting the large amounts of data needed to make our model. Using the data we found from the CDC and the Census Bureau, we made eight scatter plots, which I will show you next. The first graph on the top right shows diabetes rates and people with health insurance under the age of 65. So this one shows that people who are lacking adequate health care are more likely to get diabetes because no one is there to make sure they're living a healthy lifestyle. The second graph on the bottom left shows diabetes rates and mean commute time in New Mexico counties. So this graph is important because people who are spending long periods of time commuting are not going to be able to get the physical activity necessary to maintain a healthy weight and prevent type 2 diabetes. The graph on the top right shows diabetes rates and education levels. This graph shows that people who have a higher education are more likely to make better lifestyle choices. The graph on the bottom right shows diabetes rates and poverty rates in New Mexico counties. This is one of the most important because people who are living in poverty are going to have less access to adequate health care or education. Also, fast food tends to be much cheaper than healthy food. So these people are going to choose fast food just because it is better fit for their budget. The graphs on the top and bottom left, although we thought, we thought it was a good idea to include these, but since no correlation was found, these factors were not implemented into the neural network. The graph on the top right, although not much of a correlation is shown here, we decided to implement American Indian and Alaska Native into the model because these people are three times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than Caucasians. The graph on the bottom right shows how many fast food establishments will appear in our model when the TPR is at a certain level. Now Tristan will introduce you to our computational method. Excuse me, hold on. So one way that we decided to achieve our goal is by using a neural network. And so we named our neural network DAN, which stands for Diabetes Artificial Neural Network. And so we made two versions of DAN, DAN and DAN 3.1. And both were built in Python 3.7. DAN 2.0 uses the sigmoid function, which brings advantages and drawbacks. So an advantage is that it's very practical for percentage values. And so many of the variables that we're analyzing are percentage values. For instance, percent of the population without health insurance under 65 and percent of the population with a high school education. A drawback though is, the, and specifically one variable, commute time is in a whole number minutes. And so we actually have to adjust this variable and it's, it's sometimes it's not very inclusive to keep um, all of the all of the data in, in its original format. So one way that we have overcome this is by dividing the commute time variable by 100 to train the network and to test the network. And so 
we manually inputted the sigmoid function into the Python program using NumPy. And you can see on your screen the four um, different packages from NumPy that we utilized. EXP is um, the equivalent to, or EXP uh, is capable of calculating the exponential of elements in an array. And it's established on Euler's number, which is of course the base for the natural logarithm. And it's just a part of uh, the sigmoid function that is necessary to be manually inputted. Array is more used to format our data for the neural network and just put it into arrays. Dot really kind of works alongside the array, the array package, and it is the equivalent to matrix multiplication. And it's more for formatting the data to um, go into the neural network. It formats it into a matrix and it, um, it's more just to format our data. The random package is to generate and manage our random numbers, specifically to generate the original weights and biases at the start of the program. So you can see a diagram of DEN 2.0 on your screen. And so DEN 2.0 analyzes five variables. And so these were determined by these scatter plots that Aaron just went over. We have education, poverty, percent of American Indian and Alaska Native, um, commute time, and uh, and education, I believe. And so you can see uh, that it has one node in the hidden layer, which of course contains the sigmoid function, and one node in the output layer, which is of course the diabetes rate. And so here's some testing of DAM 2.0. You can see that the most impressive result here is how close it got to predicting the diabetes rate of Los Alamos County. Now note that this version uses the seed function from the random package. And so what this means is that every run, the weights and biases are going to be set to the same random numbers. And given the appropriate data, it, the network will output a similar prediction. Now DAN 3.1 is just generally the best version of DAN and the most accurate that we've found. So this one uses the ReU activation function which allows us to keep all of our data in its original format, which is really nice. And so you can see that the range is zero to infinity in contrast to, for the sigmoid function is zero to one. And so for this one, we can actually keep the commute time variable um, in its original format and not have to do any type of adjusting here. So we used, in addition to NumPy, Keras and TensorFlow in this version. And so Keras allows us to just design and construct our network a lot more sophisticatedly with um, many new hyperparameters like momentum, learning rate, we get to choose our optimizer and our loss function. And so these are all things that we can adjust to get the best result out of the network um, as possible. And TensorFlow is more used to run the network and it's, it's uh, used as a backend for Keras. You could also use, um, I know Facebook makes Theano, you could use um, many backends with Keras. And so here's a diagram of DAN 3.1. You can see um, that this one has two input layers, which makes it officially a deep neural network and five nodes in each, in, in each hidden layer. And so this is another um, thing that Keras allows us to do much more easily is just um, add layers um, and add nodes to each layer. And so it analyzes the same five variables. And of course it outputs a diabetes rate. And so here's some accuracy testing of DAN 3.1. Um, generally, like, like I said, like this version does not use any function to, uh, to keep the weights and biases the same every run, but generally we find it to be much more accurate than DAN 2.0. And so even when, you get, when, even when you input the same data, you can expect a different prediction every run. In fact, the only county that we found it to be less accurate in was in Los Alamos County, as you can see on your screen. Now Alexis is gonna introduce you to Miletus. So Miletus is a Latin word for diabetes, and this is our program that we have created in that Lego 6.1.1. One of our goals when we were creating Miletus was to create an easy, simple way for people to interpret this model as close to a community as possible. And we have achieved this in many ways because we have created some custom turtles to represent the demographics of the town. And we've also been able to have Miletus um, be able to analyze diabetes rates. And those are just some independent variables on your screen.
Here are a few custom turtles that we have created. The top three are unhealthy restaurants and they contribute to type 2 diabetes rates. The first one is the Mexico Fried Tacos, which is the offering for KFC. Burger Prince would be the offering for Burger King and Pizza Garden would be the offering for Olive Garden. The bottom three is office buildings and apartment buildings. Those things you'd usually see in a community. The middle one is T, which is a healthy restaurant, which stands for Tristan, Aaron, and Alexis. So now Tristan is going to talk about Melitas 5.0. So Melitas 5.0 is the best version of Melitas that does not use Dan. And so this actually brings a couple benefits that are exclusive to this version. The main benefit is accessibility. Um, this version um, is compatible with NetLogo Web, and so it makes a computer without Python or NetLogo Web, um, specifically mobile devices, an option for anybody who would otherwise not be able to access Miletus. And so accessibility is very important to our goal of educating others about diabetes. Um, so it's really nice that uh, we have this version to um, just expand um, the accessibility of our research to more people. And so instead of using Dan, it utilizes the line of best fit linear equations from these scatter plots that Aaron went over. So it outputs um, this, it gives a more linear and predictable result, but it does change um, relatively accurately um, based on the variables changed by the user. It's nowhere near as accurate to the real world as Melita's 5.1 is, but again, it is a nice way uh, to kind of get a, um, the, same, the same interface and same cosmetic details as Miletus 5.1, as well as just educating more people. And so Miletus 5.1 is, is generally the best version of Miletus. Uh, it supports Dan 2.0 using the PY extension. And so this really just brings a whole new kind of dimension to analyzing the output of Dan. So it, this allows us to, so Dan runs continuously uh, while Miletus is running. And so Miletus or Dan can adjust its output in real time based on how the, how, uh, the user is using Miletus. So linear equations continue to control um, the cosmetic details of the model, like the custom turtles that Alexis went over. But Dan's output is displayed on a plot in the interface. And um, it's really nice because we, using this method, we can not only identify which variables um, have an impact on diabetes, but how much significance each variable has on the diabetes rate. And so we made very, some very interesting discoveries using this version. And so here's the result of a test that we did. And so each, each variable slider, there's in the interface, each variable, each independent variable has its own slider. And so each variable slider was adjusted to a value that resembled halfway, while the other variables were set to zero. And so these are screenshots of the diabetes rates reaction to this. And so earlier we mentioned that it was um, surprising to see such an insubstantial correlation between American Indian and Alaska Native and diabetes rates. And this test very much reflects that. Now Erin is gonna go more into the results with you. So Miletus is a model that accurately models a town and it has the demographics and the diabetes rates. Miletus uses Dan 2.0, which helps it output an even more accurate diabetes rate. Dan can be used to identify the significance of each independent variable in the diabetes rate prediction. Using Miletus and Dan, we have identified the five most significant variables on New Mexico's diabetes rates, and these are listed from top to bottom in links to most importance. More variables should be implemented into Miletus. And Dan can be made more accurate by expanding the data set to include more of New Mexico's counties. Our results will show that ethnicity has less of an effect on diabetes rates than the controllable factors. Many factors that benefit New Mexico society as a whole can also help lower diabetes rates like education and affordable health insurance.
There's a bug in NetLogo 6.11, and Miletus does not support DAN 3.1. We used an Anaconda virtual environment, and the program gave us an error message. We translated Miletus into several other NetLogo versions, and the error persisted. Now, Tristan will introduce you to Miletus and DAN. Okay, so first, I'm going to show you DAN 2.0. So here I am in just a traditional Python IDE. And uh, here is the, the input training data here uh, that's put into arrays. And if you're curious as to where um, each variable is within this data set, you can, uh, there's a little comment up here that goes column by column and it tells you what, um, which variable is in that column. And then the output training data is of course, the corresponding diabetes rate uh, this is where we uh, set we we use the seed function to um, set the weights and biases to the to the same every run, and then here's where the sigmoid function is implemented, and um, here's where you can set the iterations. And so right now it's at three hundred thousand iterations, which is more than enough for it to come to a viable conclusion. So I can just run it here, and you can see what it outputs. And then there we go. There's our the, the diabetes rate prediction in decimal format. So now I'll show you um, Miletus 3.1. So uh, here we just import um, all of these packages from Keras that um, we need to build the neural network. And then again, it just uses the same training data, except commute time can now be in its original format and we don't have to divide it by 100. This and this one, this is where we test. This is where we test a new input, and then down here is where we um is where we define all of these great new hyperparameters that we can use, um and make the the network better. So you can see that the learning rate is set to uh, 0 0.001, momentum is set to 0 0.7, and so we we've determined uh, these hyperparameters just based off of testing um using our testing data that we saved, and just um pretty much just experimenting with the network to see what works and what doesn't. So I can run it here. And then there's the diabetes rate prediction in decimal format, once again. So now I'll show you uh, Miletus 5.0. So here's Miletus 5.0. Uh, you can see, I can just click set up and go. And then here's this really beautiful interface with our custom turtles. And um, it, it looks like a, a real, town um and so now we can just adjust these these sliders and the diabetes rate uh goes up and down accordingly and so these are this is just based off of the correlations that we made in the line of best fit so it pretty much just works how you would expect if the poverty rate goes down the diabetes rate goes down if the education level goes up the uh, diabetes rate goes down and so I can show you actually where these scatter plots are implemented in our code. So down here is um, where it is. So it just gets uh, in a mean value from um, from these equations right here, and it sets it as a diabetes rate. So now I'll show you Milius 5.1. And so this one is um, what I'm most excited about. Uh, I can, you see, I can click set up and go, and it looks at like first at first glance, it looks uh, pretty similar to Milius 5.0, but the changes are really on the inside of the model. So you can see now we have a Dan prediction here as a diabetes rate, and this model just gives us a new um, a new uh, more complex look at uh, what causes diabetes rates. And so note that this version, um, the iterations are set to 50,000 instead of what they would normally be set as 100,000, just to reduce the, the chance of lag in our presentation. But this shouldn't have too much to do with the actual accuracy of it. It shouldn't have a too big of an effect. After all, it is consistently running in the model. And so now I can show you exactly where our code is implemented here. You can see um, 
we uh, are converting net logo values to uh, values that can be read by the Python or the PY extension. Here's where our code is. And then here's where we actually get the output from the model. And here's where it sets it as the diabetes rate. And do you have any questions? Thank you, judges. Any questions? I'm going to try again. I don't know if my audio is working any better. Uh, how much uh, in Dan, in version 5.1, how much other than user interface remains in the, in the net logo model and how much is been moved, completely moved into the Python? Um, so the pretty much the only difference between Melitis 5.0 and Melitis 5.1 is how it um, contracts the diabetes rate. So pretty much all of the code stays almost exactly the same, um, except for the, the setup diabetes rate um, function, I guess you would call it in another go. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Stephen Guerin. So right now your model doesn't really uh, generate or influence the rate of diabetes, right? It's coming from your data and either your linear model or your neural net. Is that a fair statement? So I think you're saying that like the like the custom turtles and stuff don't don't affect the diabetes rate, right? Right. Right. So so really they don't. And so but this really like the independent variables that the user can control, that's really what um what controls the diabetes rate. And so we wanted to make sure that like uh, it was still able to do like what a traditional Python IDE would be able to do, like inputting different um, different variables and testing them without right. like, without having like the number of, of fast food restaurants really affect that because the user can't control the number of fast food restaurants. So we wanted it to be, to remain like, like um, really like have complete control of the model. Okay. So, so right now it's a very cool use of NetLogo for visualizing a Python, you know, analytics and then a city. Could you, could you see how the age, talk to me or just kind of explore how the agent based model might be used for exploring incidents and generating uh, data sets that would be the diabetes incidents. Can you think about how the agent model would be used? So, so we could make it like, more able to generate its own data, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. without the user having to control any sliders. So for instance, uh, if there was a certain number of, of say, say healthcare facilities, then the lack of health insurance, or like the lack of health insurance could go down. Or right, say- or the, uh, um, Like the frequency of your fast food restaurants using fast food, right? Or something. Yeah, or would say we could implement um, like schools. And so, mm -hmm or colleges or just education facilities. And so if these education facilities, like the number went down, then the percent without a high school um, education would also go down and that would mm -hmm. impact the diabetes rate. I see. And then do you see maybe, I'm just wondering if the neural net could be used to, like if you have sliders for like fast food use and generating uh, a diabetes rate, incidence rate, the neural net might be able to help you tune the model to match what you're observing in the real world as an example. Do you see how that might be? Yeah, for sure. So, so we would actually really like to have um, the neural net analyze like number of fast food or density of fast food of some sort. But the thing is like, like how many fast food, um, like how many like fast, like the number of fast food uh, establishments in a certain place is like pretty like arbitrary. Right, so like what is considered like a fast food restaurant and how do you collect that data to put it in your neural network? And so that's really why it's not implemented in the neural network. Yeah, but very nice integration. So this is Dave Janicki. I'm interested in your original data shows quite a bit of scatter and have you thought about how to integrate that into your own neural nets I mean, to a certain extent some of that i think you're getting with looking at some of your demographics but it strikes me your next step could be to 
uh, sort of make Dan a little bit more complicated to or or else run multiple evaluations of the models um, to to get that diversity in in outputs that your scatter plot show. Um, so, so like the scatter plots, um, they, like really some of them didn't show like a significant correlation, right? Like, um, but that's also kind of why we chose a neural network is because we wanted it to like maybe pick up where like we couldn't just eyeball a scatter plot, then maybe like a neural network could pick up a pattern and then um, be able to like predict the diabetes, right? And then we could use like the plot tool to um, analyze which variable is contributed, contributing to this diabetes rate. And so that's really um, like why we uh, decided to continue on with the variables that we chose was because we were using a neural network, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm always intrigued that with natural data, there are underlying behaviors that are, that are not necessarily a linear fit. And so um, in, in my work as a geoscientist, I'm always looking for two things. One is, can I explain any of the outliers or is there something that's special there that I should be looking at? And can I model a fit that isn't the linear sort of average, but what's the end that's being modeled and how does, how does that work? And, and so you might think a little bit about how your neural net could go after something a little bit deeper than a, a linear fit. That makes sense. That would that would be really good. I sent you some comments on this, and um, you, you're looking at this and saying, I mean, these these variables are obviously not linearly related, um, and so it would make a whole lot more sense to use a uh, Spearman rank correlation. Where instead of putting in the actual values, you put in their rank. So you rank each variable um, in your data set and use those ranks to try to come up with a correlation. And if, if the variables are monotonic, then it will tell you whether there is a correlation, a nonlinear correlation. Uh, your neural uh, network uh, kind of does get a, a nonlinear um, behavior into your model, but um, you know when I read the report, the you're looking and saying that there's a linear correlation amongst uh, between these variables, and you look at the plot, the scatter plot, and it's obvious that there isn't. It's a nonlinear relation so that was the main thing that i that i comment that i had on your uh, i think that would improve it to to switch to uh, looking at it in a uh, non-linear correlation yes i i would definitely agree on that um so like our entire like project kind of went about no, like assuming that these correlations were linear yeah and they really probably weren't yeah, and then and I, I, I think you did a good job with that assumption, but I think that's probably not a good assumption. All right, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Grady. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.